uh, and colleague of Rainbow's, Claire Ansley, uh, who's going to introduce Rainbow properly. Claire is a professor of politics at Sussex, previously at Manchester, and she's also, appropriately enough for the lecture tonight, the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor uh, for Equalities and Diversity. So, Claire. everyone, um, good evening and, and welcome everybody, um, well thank you for that warm welcome to me, but we're here today to um, <coughs> let's say welcome to everybody uh, to the inaugural lecture of <coughs> Professor Rainbow Murray. Professor Rainbow Murray, that sounds really good, doesn't it? Um, congratulations Professor Murray, it's an absolute honour and a pleasure to be here tonight to chair your event, um, to introduce your work. Um, to celebrate this wonderful occasion with family, with friends, with colleagues, some students maybe, and other guests. It's a real honour to be here. Um, and it's wonderful too, and very apt, and probably no coincidence that today is also International Women's Day. Um, yeah. So let me just say, uh, happy International Women's Day to everybody here in the room today. Um, I think everybody probably knows that each year for International Women's Day there's a theme and the theme for International Women's Day is um, press for progress or hashtag press for protest mm. and I think that is so apt because um, press for progress could actually in fact be Rainbow's personal and professional motto if she were to have one. Um, I've known Rainbow for uh, a long time. Um, I totted it up the years from when I think we first met um, and it comes to about 16 years. So I've known Rainbow um, a very long time. Uh, we first met at the University of Manchester when we were both based there. And I've seen Rainbow really you know, press for progress um, towards gender equality in so many ways in the time that I've known her um, in those 16 years. Um, some of you will know at the University of Manchester, she was the women's officer in the Students' Union. Um, she's been senior diversity lead on, um, here at Queen Mary. Um, she also presses for progress as a, as a role model for other women in the profession, um, for her students, and whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, probably her two young children as well. Um, she also presses for progress as um, a representative and a respected expert in um, the UK, um, in France and a number of other places um, across the world. She really does have a fantastic um, reputation in her field. Um, Rainbow's capacity <coughs> to press for progress though is most evident, it's most visible um, because of her absolutely razor sharp intellect which allows her, or gives her the capacity to really pick apart problems and cut through um, perceived wisdoms and really try to get to the bottom of what we need to do to push for gender equality. And I remember being struck by this the very first time that I, I met Rainbow and had a conversation with her, just you know, being struck by that razor sharp um, intellect. And, and I think, you know, it's absolutely wonderful to be here today to celebrate um, Professor Murray. Over the course of her career, um, Rainbow has tackled the issue of gender equality and pushed for, and uh, pressed for progress in this area, um, in, particularly in the field of politics, formal politics. And what she tries to do is make sense of what it is that's holding women back and what can we do, what needs to be done to try and create a more level playing field or to close the gap between men and women in politics. Um, so for example, the use and effectiveness of gender quotas or quotas for women um, as a mechanism for trying to increase the, the presence of women in um, formal politics is a very strong theme throughout Rainbow's work. Um, as is the role of the media in how they both portray I nearly said betray, <laughs> portray, betray, and also police women who um, are political um, women. 
Um, so this is the theme of Rainbow's work um, over, over the years. Um, Rainbow um, graduated from the University of Manchester with a first class um, degree. She got a distinction in her um, Embraer's at Birkbeck. Um, her PhD was awarded also by Birkbeck um, University of London, and that was a study of gender quotas and candidate selection um, in France. And from that, throughout her career here at Queen Mary, Rainbow's gone on to study um, a number of fascinating issues which, which you know, are just so exciting <coughs> to read about. So what do MPs do once they get elected? So for example, she did a great study on where do MPs go, what kind of committees do MPs get um, appointed to when they enter um, Parliament? And also, you know, what holds women back from, or what, you know, what are the circumstances in which women are, can, are candidates and are campaigning um, for um, executive um, office? And I have to say, it is no exaggeration to say that Rainbow's research in this area is absolutely game-changing. Her, particularly her research about the criteria um, that qualify someone for political office have fundamentally changed the way um, we think about um, and the way that we talk about women's representation in politics. So put really simply, what she's done is urged us and persuaded a lot of us um, to stop thinking about the underrepresentation of women as the problem, but to focus instead in the overrepresentation of men in political life as a problem. And if you flip the problem like that in the really clever way that Rainbow has done, we can change the way that we try and think about the solution. So what we're not doing is thinking about quotas for women to promote women, but actually thinking about kind of maximum quota um, for men. And this is really the way, the kind of thinking, really smart thinking that we have to do if we want to press for progress um, towards more gender equality. It's such exciting work. But as we know, the title of Rainbow's lecture tonight is Best Man for the Job, what, is, um, what it really takes to be a representative. Um, so I think I should not say any more and not give away too, many, too much of Rainbow's um, uh, really smart thinking, but instead hand over to Rainbow um, to present her um, lecture. So it is with the greatest of pleasure that I've been invited here um, to Queen Mary tonight, um, and I would like at this point, Rainbow, to, or Professor Murray, I should say, to call on you to um, deliver your um, inaugural lecture um, for us tonight. blushing now. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Claire, for that very warm introduction, which gave such a good overview of my career that I almost wonder now if the rest of my talk is kind of superfluous. I think you did a great job for me. Um, thank you very much. And I would really like to thank everybody who's come this evening. Um, it's a real joy and pleasure to have you all here. Um, I'm particularly delighted to have my family here with me this evening, so thank you all very much for being here. Um, An inaugural lecture celebrates the process of becoming a professor, and it's a personal and a professional journey uh, to get here. And so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to go through the key moments of the professional journey with so many people who have shared that personal journey with me. Um, two people that Claire mentioned who are obviously not here tonight because they're too young. Um, my children, I hope they'll be able to watch this one day without being too embarrassed by me. <laughs> um, so as Claire mentioned, this journey started in Manchester. Um, I originally thought I was going to be a, a French studies person, but I wasn't really into literature, I was into understanding the world. So I ended up reading European studies in French, which is how I discovered the amazing world of politics and got completely hooked and never looked back. And uh, I also mentioned that I was 
the women's officer at my student's union. So that got me really interested in uh, gender and women's rights. And so this combination of France, gender and politics came together in a wonderful way uh, when I spent a year in France as part of my undergraduate study. And France had just introduced the world's first 50% gender quota, uh, known as the parity law. Um, and so I got to observe the very first stages of its implementation while I was there, and I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. I would like to carry on studying this. And so that's what I did. Um, I moved down to London and did a PhD with Johnny Lewandowski, um, who, for those who are familiar with the field, is uh, one of the most eminent scholars um, ever to contribute to this field, and a real pioneer. And the first thing that I wanted to really get my head around was why this amazing 50% gender quota turned out to be, in fact, rather unamazing. Um, it was introduced uh, in the year 2000 and first implemented in the year 2002, at which point there was a one percentage point increase in the proportion of women in Parliament. So people thought, yay, we're going from 10% to 50%. And in fact, they went from 10% to just over 12%. It wasn't, it wasn't a game changer. And so I tried to understand what the reasons for that were. And it became clear to me early on in my study that if you want to understand what's going on with gender quotas and more broadly with women's representation, you have to start with political parties. Uh, they are the people who control the show. And so I wanted to see why some political parties were more motivated than others to implement a gender quota. And um, this ended up becoming um, oh, I have a slide up. this ended up becoming uh, my first book. And um, what I found was that there are different reasons why a political party might be motivated to introduce a gender quota. Um, it could be because it has a sincere ideological commitment to quotas, it could be because um, it feels that it needs to feminise its, um, its political personnel in order to update its reputation and its image, or, or to keep up with competitive parties who've done the same, or it could just be that it's become forced to by a different party who's uh, introduced legalised quotas and then it has no choice. So this was the work that um, got me started, and I was then lucky enough to land a job here at Queen Mary, uh, where I've been thriving ever since, thanks to the fantastic colleagues that I've had the pleasure of working with here, both uh, within and beyond my department. Now, one thing that was very fortunate for me while I was on the job market at the end of my PhD was that my Research suddenly called a bit of media attention, thanks to <coughs> this lady here, Céveline Royal, um, who ran for the presidency in 2007 in France. And she was <coughs> the first woman to qualify for the second round, and um, was for a while considered possibly France's first woman president. Sadly, more than a decade later, that still hasn't come to pass. Um, and when looking at the failure of her campaign, I was really curious about why she didn't actually succeed. And I saw that there were a number of features of the way that she was covered in the media that were distinctive to the way that men were covered. She was always referred to by her first name, sometimes not even Sigel, and sometimes just Sigo. Um, people talked a lot about her appearance, um, what she was wearing. Uh, people talked a lot about her four children. And they are the same four children that Francois Hollande had because they had those children together. And yet, they were not mentioned at all when he ran for president five years later. But they were mentioned a lot when it was her turn. And it so happened that she was part of an international wave of women trying to tap at that highest glass ceiling of politics, um, the absolute summit of politics. So um, Angela Merkel had recently become Chancellor of Germany for the first time. Um, Hillary Clinton ran for the Democratic nomination in 2008. Um, we also saw the rise of um, a few women presidents in uh, Latin America, such as Michelle Bachelet in Chile, um, Christina Fernandez Kirchner in um, Argentina. Uh, we also saw Ellen Johnson Sirleaf coming into power in Liberia. 
So there was this sudden wave of, of women trying to crack that highest class ceiling. And so I got together with some scholars from around the world and I said, well, look, this is what I found. How about you? And um, that was not my next slide. <laughs> some of my slides are missing. Doesn't matter. Um, yeah, that became um, a book where we all got together to try and compare and contrast the experiences that we'd had and what we'd found. And it turned out that a lot of the patterns that we'd found that had been attributed in each case to the individual woman, that you know, people always talked about her partner because she happened to have this famous partner who was also in politics, we thought, well, actually, you know, that's not necessarily the case. All these trends that we found that had been blamed on the individual women candidates turned out, for the most part, to be global trends that are just how we deal with women trying to tackle power. And the biggest issue that we found was that women were faced with um, this masculinity-femininity double bind, whereby politics is gendered to the masculine, and especially politics at the leadership level. You're expected to be ambitious, aggressive, tough, if you want to run a country. And so to be a leader, a woman has to be all those things. But the problem is that that contradicts societal expectations of femininity. So in order to tick that box, you're then not a very good woman and people don't like you. And sadly, that's an issue that continues to plague women candidates, as we saw uh, very strikingly in um, Hillary Clinton's second run for the presidency in America in 2016. And this triggered a broader interest in studying elections, um, which uh, continues to this day. Uh, there are a few people out there in the world um, who think that that's the main thing I do, that I study elections, because that's when I tend to get media coverage. Um, but actually, as Claire said, my real passion uh, above all else is understanding what goes on between elections and understanding um, gendered representation and gender quotas. So this led to a series of articles um, in the early stages of my career trying to understand how gender quotas worked, whether they worked, and uh, if not, why not? So one of the big questions that I wanted to ask was why would political parties adopt gender quotas, actually? Because it places restrictions on candidate selection processes, so they're limiting their own control of who they can choose to run for office. And perhaps more importantly, um, Getting into Parliament is a zero-sum game. There are only so many seats in Parliament, so if you want more women, you have to have fewer men. So why would the men in Parliament vote themselves out of office by allowing women to come in? And uh, that was a real curiosity for me. And that was one of the things that um, drove my early research, uh, drove that book trying to understand when and why parties would actually consider it a good idea to implement gender quotas. And there are times, of course, when political parties don't want to, when they feel that their hand is forced and they will try anything and everything to resist. And um, parties have done some scandalous things over the years in attempts to resist gender quotas. Sometimes they simply don't implement them. Um, sometimes they prefer to take financial penalties rather than implement them. Um, sometimes they will field women in unwinnable seats, so that they officially have lots of women candidates, but they're condemning those women to failure, which then makes the women look bad when in fact there was nothing they could have done because no candidate could have won that seat. Sometimes candidates who have been bumped out of pole position by their party to make way for a woman will go and run as an independent candidate. Maybe they get elected and then take the party whip back straight after the election. Or maybe they split the vote and fail to get elected and let the other side in. That's the way the woman doesn't win. I've even heard stories uh, in some Latin American countries of candidates who have changed their name by deep poll to a woman's name just for the period of the election to try and pass off as a woman and then afterwards said, oh wait, no, oh sorry, I'm a guy. So parties who don't want to won't implement gender quotas. But that notwithstanding, there are still some instances where quotas have been very effective. So I try to understand why quotas might be adopted, why they don't always work, 
And one reason that it can't be used to explain why gender quotas work is that there is no evidence that voters discriminate against women candidates. Um, I've tested it, other people have tested it, and the answer is the people vote for party tickets. Unless you have done something extraordinarily bad, if you're running for parliament, people don't actually care all that much who you are. They care who's going to form the next government, they care who's going to be the next leader. And uh, so there, it isn't voter discrimination, it comes back down to parties. I mentioned some of the lengths that men will go to to avoid losing their seat. And there is a problem here. What do you do with men who want to be in Parliament if you're trying to feminise politics? What about the men who are already in Parliament, the incumbents? Do you force them to vacate their seats? Seems a little bit ungrateful. Thank you very much for serving for the past however many years. Uh, now here's your P45, goodbye. If we decide not to do that, and if parties feel that it's not politically expedient to do that, then you're left with the new opportunities that arise at each election, and there aren't that many of them. But when those new opportunities do arise, because someone's retired or because it's a swing seat, do you give all of those new opportunities to women? If you do, that seems a little bit unfair to all of the next generation of men who might be perfectly decent people, perfectly qualified candidates who want a political career and can't be held responsible for historical injustices. Okay, so you don't want to do that. So you give 50% of new seats to women. Um, and then you realise that actually things don't change all that dramatically because there's only a low turnover of seats and only half of those seats are going to women if you're lucky. And so what we often see with gender quotas is that they generate expectations of a gender revolution, an overnight dramatic change in the composition of Parliament, when in fact the more likely outcome is a form of evolution where over a series of elections we see parliaments becoming more and more feminised. My last big question on the early stages of gender quotas and their implementation was what about people who get elected through a gender quota? Um, are they the same effectively as everyone who came before them? Are they good enough for the job? And I realised here that we're actually imposing an impossible double standard on women because we're expecting them to be two things at the same time. We're expecting them to be the same as the people who came before them so that they can say, look, there's nothing to fear here, um, I meet the status quo, I hold up to the standards of, of what's come before, I am elite enough, good enough for the job. And at the same time, we're expecting them to be something new, something different, changing the game because that's part of the reason why people justify needing more women because you know, they're, they're different and they bring these extra qualities to the job. But you can't be the same and different at the same time. It's a classic equality difference dilemma. And so I worried that whichever way we looked at it, we risked setting women up to fail. And that led into my next big <coughs> research agenda, which was um, studying the um, the impact of gender quotas, not just their effectiveness in terms of getting women into Parliament, but what difference it, they made to Parliament after those elections. Um, I'm a bit nervous about whether this slide is going to match up. No, it doesn't. I clearly have the wrong version of my slides up here, but it doesn't matter. I've got the right version here, and that's all that's good. Um, so this led to another big book project, looking at whether quotas had a transformative effect on how Parliaments work. So I started off with this, trying to understand whether women came from different backgrounds, and the answer is a little bit yes, but they're still more, they're more like the elites that came in, in Parliament before them than they are like society in general, but they're still a bit more like society in general than previous politicians, so sort of a bit of both. Um, do they, are they as effective as legislators once they get to Parliament? Short answer, yes. Do they focus on different issues as parliamentarians? And what I found here was, was pretty interesting, that men and women, for the most part, focus on the same issues. They may bring slightly different perspectives to those issues, but as a general rule, they're interested in broadly the same things, with two exceptions. The first of those exceptions 
is that women care a lot more about women's rights than men do. So that confirms the hypothesis that if you want women's rights on the agenda, you need women there to do it. The second finding was that it matters whether anyone's watching or not. What do I mean by that? Well, most of the work that goes on in Parliament goes on unobserved, behind the scenes, no one's really paying any attention. And when no one's paying any attention, men and women pretty much just get on with the, the job in the same way. The main exception to this is questions, uh, Prime Minister's questions or questions to the government in France. That's televised and has um, <coughs> viewing figures in the millions. And so this is Parliament's window to the world. And rather than MPs autonomously going around doing their thing, parties stage manage questions to the government. And they choose who asks questions on what. And when they stage manage the process, suddenly women start asking questions about the stereotypically feminised areas of politics. Anything to do with care. So child care, care for the elderly, social care, health care, education, all of that. Whereas men suddenly start asking questions about the economy, finance, foreign affairs, defence. So this gender gap that didn't actually really exist becomes manufactured on the basis of gender stereotypes and that is what is projected to the world that's watching. And so we have this conception that politics is far more gendered than is actually the case. And so we're kind of recreating and reinforcing those gender stereotypes. And in fact, that ended up being the dominant theme of this research. That at every stage of the work that they did, at every stage of their career, women kept coming up against these gender stereotypes. They found themselves stereotyped into different portfolios in the early stages of their careers, in local politics, for example. And then once they got to Parliament, that fed into what they did in parliamentary committees, because people said, oh, in local politics, you're a spokesperson on this and that, so you can, you can do that again in your committee work. And so we found that women ended up on the Social Affairs Committee, on the Cultural Affairs Committee, which, by the way, are the lowest prestige committees. And men ended up on the high prestige committees of finance, um, foreign affairs and defence. And this wasn't based on their professional qualifications, their educational qualifications, their personal trajectories. It was based on the impact of gender stereotyping at the point where other people started making decisions for them. And it feeds all the way up into government, where, uh, and this is something that uh, Claire Anderson has worked on, where we see that there is gender stereotyping in the allocation of government portfolios, and that makes it difficult for women to reach the summit of politics. I was also interested in whether men and women had different perceptions of their roles as representatives, whether women felt a particular responsibility to speak for other women having been elected through a gender <coughs> And there was some evidence of that, but there was also a lot of expression of frustration at this idea of being pigeonholed as women and constantly coming up against <coughs> gender stereotypes. And this is work that I did um, for a large part in Paris in collaboration with Rajan Senak, uh, who I've worked with for many years in many fruitful collaborations uh, that I've greatly enjoyed. And while I was conducting this field work in Paris, um, I took a break for a few days to attend a workshop um, organised by Mona Lynn Crook um, at Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, many of the leading experts on gender qualities in the world were there, um, wonderful people like Sarah Childs, and Susan Francesca, Jennifer Piscopo. And we talked a lot about gender quotas, and one of the questions we were asking was whether women were as good as men. And I sat there listening to these presentations thinking, but we don't ever ask whether men are as good as women. We don't ever ask whether men are good enough, full stop. We take it for granted. It's, it's just taken as a given. Men are already there. They've already had ample opportunity to prove their competence because they're already on the inside. And if you come across a man who isn't good, you see his incompetence as a reflection of him as an individual not as an indicator that men as a collective group are not competent, because there are so many <coughs> competent men there that they hold up the image of men as a whole. And so I thought, why are we not questioning men's credentials? Why do we just assume that they somehow have this right to be there? And so I came back from uh, America to Paris and spent some time mulling over this question. You got a <coughs> glimpse earlier of my next slide, which is this lovely park um, Parc Monserie in Paris, 
A few of you will have visited me while I was uh, living there and might recognise it. It's a lovely place. I walked around that park many, many times. I walked around that pond many, many times. <coughs> um, um, to quote my favourite cartoon character, Garfield, some call it laziness, I call it deep thought. <laughs> So, yes, I was admiring the beautiful scenery, but I was also thinking about this question over and over and over. How do we crack this problem? And the solution that I came up with was one that Claire alluded to earlier, this idea of quotas for men. I don't know what happens to my slides, so we're going to stick with the, we're going to stick with the dark pond, because, you know, it's pretty. So, <laughs> Quotas for men. Um, this was an attempt to challenge this notion of men being the default, the insiders, and women being the other on the outside, trying to justify their inclusion. And I thought, well, maybe men should have to justify their inclusion um, in large numbers. And so I thought, rather than focusing all the time on women's underrepresentation, maybe we should take the problem to men and think about male overrepresentation and think about why that might be problematic. And apart from anything else, we have a lot of men in politics, and not only are they more than the 50% of society that they represent, but they're not even particularly representative of that 50% of society. If we look at the men who are in Parliament, they tend to be this very narrow elite group of men drawn primarily from very privileged, affluent backgrounds, particular educational backgrounds, particular ethnic backgrounds. Um, they tend to be heterosexual, they tend to be able-bodied. They come from a very narrow subset of society. And I reject the notion that you have to be a member of that subgroup to be qualified for office, that talent is somehow magically bestowed uniquely upon this small group of individuals. I think for most things, talent is fairly randomly <coughs> distributed across society. But if your talent pool covers the whole of society, but the talent pool into which you're dipping is just this very small subset, then you're going to get the best people, I would hope, from within that subset, but then you're going to have to dip quite a long way below the cream of the crop to get your number of representatives. And so rather than having the best of all of society, you're having the best and the rest from this little group. And that's not good for the quality of representation. And that then isn't good for anybody that's being represented. And so this led me to think, well, we need to do <coughs> other things. We need to place more emphasis on men's credentials for why they are in office, so that we can perhaps justify weeding out some of the men who are not quite so good. And that would then explain how you justify getting from <coughs> this big group of men down to a smaller group of men without coming across those barriers that I mentioned earlier, um, the barriers that meant that we ended up with a slow evolution rather than a fast revolution. And it also meant that we needed to think a lot more carefully about what we actually meant by being qualified for office. And last but not least, I thought, well, we actually need to recognise that having this massive overrepresentation of men isn't just a problem for women, it's a problem for everybody. We are all going to suffer if the quality of representation is diminished by being too narrow in our selection process. So I'm going to explore those themes in a bit more depth. The first broad theme that I wanted to work on was this notion of male overrepresentation. And this is a fruitful collaboration that I started with Ellen Bjornago from uh, the University of Uppsala, uh, where we decided that we wanted to start looking at the structures that maintain men in power. Rather than scrutinising every aspect of women's lives to try and find out why there weren't more women in politics, we thought, well, what are men doing? to cling so tenaciously onto politics? What are the networks and resources that facilitate men's stranglehold on power? We really need to understand that to know what's going on. Because as long as men are holding onto power and not letting go, women are not going to be getting a look at I also wanted us to subject men to 
greater scrutiny of their merit and worth, and then to consider what the consequences were of male dominance and what it meant for policy outputs and for representation as a whole that we have this male overrepresentation problem. And so we've worked on this angle in a number of ways. We've organised workshops, uh, we've done publications together, um, we have created a, a network on men in politics which has now drawn in a, a growing number of, politics, uh, of scholars sorry, who are interested in this area. And my own personal focus within this research agenda is thinking about the ways in which men as citizens might not benefit from this male overrepresentation. And I mentioned previously that the men who are in Parliament aren't necessarily reflective of men as a whole. They're this very narrow subset. And one of the things that we've thought about a lot when thinking about women's representation, we said it's not sufficient just to have a few women in Parliament because women are so diverse. We're different ages, we're different ethnicities, we come from different class backgrounds, we, we have different family responsibilities, we have different ethnic orientations, we are diverse in so many different ways. And I thought, well, that's also true of men. Men are just as diverse as women are. And yet, the men in Parliament are not diverse. And so, all the men who don't fall into this very specific, narrow definition of masculinity are also <coughs> being excluded. And we do recognise that people from ethnic minorities are not well represented in Parliament. We recognise that there aren't many working class people, there aren't many disabled people in Parliament. But we don't often think about how that intersects with male gender. But what it means to be a man is different if you're white or if you're black or if you're Asian. What it means to be a man is different if you're able-bodied or not. It's different if you are heterosexual or not. And so there are a lot of different understandings of what it means to be a man and what men need as men that are not currently represented in Parliament. And one of the problems within that is that you end up with um, a form of hegemonic masculinity, um, or to put it another way, a group of <coughs> alpha males. Here's the slide that relates to that. Um, who have a very specific culture that excludes a lot of men. And it also excludes certain ways of doing politics. And for example, it makes it quite difficult to put certain sensitive issues on the table. It becomes difficult within this culture of dominant masculinity to talk about male vulnerability, to talk about some of the needs of men who are not included in the political process. So I came to the slightly counterintuitive conclusion that men may actually need women as representatives in order to transform that culture, in order to make the process more inclusive. And we also need a much greater diversity of men within uh, the 50% of men that we should have in Parliament. Um, and I had the privilege of uh, developing some of these ideas whilst um, being a fellow at the London School of Economics with Anne Phillips. I then started thinking about this question of merit and this notion that gender quotas undermine meritocracy. I had a lovely cartoon to go with this one. Um, so we often hear the claim made, well, gender quotas are all very well and good, but I don't want someone chosen because she's a woman. I want someone chosen because they are the best person for the job. And that argument comes up time and time again. Not a woman, best person for the job. And I thought, actually, there's a whole raft of unspoken assumptions in a statement like that. And they're all wrong. And so I'm going to actually name those assumptions and I'm going to show why they're wrong. So the first assumption within that is that women aren't getting selected because it is a meritocracy and therefore it's the best people, in the, uh, the best people for the job who are getting the job. And so what we're saying there is that 
people who are currently in Parliament are there purely on their own merit. And I've already... <laughs> Yes, we've, we've seen some expensive scandals, we've seen some sexual harassment scandals, we've seen plenty of evidence that the people currently in the job are not necessarily the, the greatest of the good. Um, and I've also expressed my scepticism that uh, the ability to represent is, is uniquely bestowed upon this group of individuals. And it's actually quite insulting, really. It adds insult to injury to say to all of the groups that aren't presence in politics at the moment, well, it's your fault because you're not good enough. Um, and there's so much research already out there demonstrating that actually it's not merit, it's got nothing to do with merit. There are all these other barriers that exclude women and other groups from politics. And if you got rid of those barriers, they would do perfectly well, thank you very much. And that leads to the second assumption, that anyone who's elected through a quota was elected only because of the quota and not because of the merit. So if you abandon meritocracy and sweep and gender quotas are going to end up with a bunch of substandard politicians. Well, that's not true either. The evidence has demonstrated that women who've come in through a gender quota are at least as good as men, sometimes better. And that it raises the standards of everyone, both men and women, when you have a gender quota in place. Thirdly, if you are trying to claim that we have a meritocracy, then by extension, you need to know what we mean by merit. Because obviously, if we're selecting the best people for the job, we know what that means. But actually, we don't. What is merit in politics? And the answer is it depends on who you ask. If you ask political parties, what does a good candidate look like? They will say, well, we want someone who's completely devoted to the campaign, can make themselves available 24-7, is loyal to the party, willing to toe the party line, eloquent and uh, good at putting their viewpoint across, and so on. But if you look at academics and what they measure quality on, they tend to look at people's educational qualifications, the professions that they've had, their income levels, partly because we're not crutches and those are easy things to measure. But then if you ask the voters, what do you want in a representative? They'll tell you something different altogether. I want someone who understands me, who knows what matters to me, who's uh, comfortable with my issues, someone who I see around in the constituency, someone who's from the constituency, people like local people. <coughs> so we don't actually know what we mean by merit. But one thing that we do know is that if you're trying to evaluate merit, your starting point is typically to look at the people already doing the job. Because that is your benchmark. And so we tend to measure merit against people who are already in the job, which means we're measuring it against the status quo. And um, there we go. Um, so we're, we're measuring them against the status quo, and that isn't actually necessarily where merit in politics lies. Um, and I'm going to speak in a few minutes about how else we might define merit, if not this way. But it means that, fourthly, we are therefore assuming that the status quo is the way to go, that it's the best that we can do. And again, I would argue that that's not the case. And one of the reasons why that's not the case is because being a representative is unlike any other job. And one of the ways in which it's unlike any other job is that we need to think about two dimensions of merit simultaneously. The individual dimension of merit, what each person personally and uniquely brings to the table, but also the collective dimension of merit. And this is something where Claire Anderson's work has really inspired me. Um, where we're thinking about the ability as a collective group of politicians to represent society. And that is where diversity would actually be a measure of merit. Because Parliament as a whole cannot claim to fulfil the function of representation if it is not representative of society as a whole. So we need people who are able to bring that diversity to the table. In the same way that a football team is not going to succeed if all it has is strikers. You need a balance. So this led me to ask, well, what does it really take to represent? If not reproducing the status quo, then what? What's actually important for representation? And I came to the conclusion that maybe we need to start over, go back to basics, go back to first principles and think, well, what 
do we actually need our representatives to do? What qualities does it take? <coughs> Maybe we should come up with a, a job description and a person specification to think about what it really means to be a representative. And this then led me to one of the great paradoxes of representation. We want our representatives to be two things at the same time which are kind of mutually exclusive to an extent. <coughs> Firstly, we want them to be better than us. We want them to be the best that we've got. Of course we do. They have the most important job out there. We want them to run the country. They need to be doing that job very well. So we want people who are intelligent, people who are talented, people who have the highest standards of morals and integrity and honesty, the greater the good. But at the same time, we want people who are like us, people that we can relate to, people that we can identify with, people who know our issues, our lived experiences, our problems, and are effective at conveying them to other people. And it's much easier to do that if you have lived that yourself, if you really know what it means and really care about it. One of the reasons why people voted for George Bush rather than John Kerry was they thought that he would be a more fun person to have a beer with at a barbecue. Really. So we want people that we can identify with, that we can see as one of us. So that creates this dilemma. How can you be elite without being elitist, to steal a phrase from the University of Leicester? And that then raised the question of whether or not we should have professional politicians. Goodness knows where my slide for that one went. There we go. Um, should we have <coughs> professional politicians? And as a general rule, the public don't like the idea of professional politicians. They don't like the idea that people have spent all of their lives inside the so-called Westminster bubble, with no knowledge of the real world outside, no lived <coughs> experience of people's problems, no idea of how to run a business or any of that. And they have this, uh, in many respects, actually a misperception that career politicians are people who are only in it for themselves, to self-advance and not for the greater good. At the same time, it can be difficult to be an amateur politician. It can be difficult to get on the inside of track and find your way in. It can be difficult to know what you're doing once you get there. We want our politicians to know the rules of the game, to be able to play the game well, <coughs> to advocate for our needs but if they don't hit the ground running because they have no idea of the job, then they're going to struggle. Remember, these are people who are doing the most important job in the country. And I spoke to a senior official within one of our political parties last week, and she said that you wouldn't <coughs> go for medical advice to someone who didn't have a medical degree. You wouldn't want someone to fix your broken sink who had no experience of plumbing. So why do, would we want people to run the country who have no knowledge or experience of politics. So here we have another dilemma. Do we want professional politicians or do we want people who have lived outside the political world? And when we're looking at candidate selection, at the moment, what are we missing? If we're looking primarily at what's come before, but we're arguing that what's come before is not necessarily what's right, then what have we left out? And this is an ongoing question that I'm trying to answer. What else? might make people well qualified for office that we need to tap into in order to get the best people for the job. And when we're thinking about the best people for the job, we're talking about meritocracy and saying, well, you know, if you were good enough, you would have got there, and if you didn't get there, it was because you weren't good enough. Well, sadly, that simply isn't true. The reality is that there are a whole raft of barriers that make it harder for some people than others to get to the top to rise to the top, irrespective of their merit. And the project that I'm working on at the moment is uh, it's called Money Talks, and it's a project, um, I'm a member of an international team, where we are looking at the role of money in shaping access to politics. And so I've been interviewing a lot of candidates in the UK, uh, both successful and not, to understand how they got there or didn't and what stood in their way. And it turns out that money is, in fact, a huge barrier. We don't tend to think about it because 
the campaign expenses that we think about are covered by political parties. You have to declare them in your electoral team. So what's the problem? The problem is that, first of all, you have to meet a lot of costs off your own back as a candidate that are never reimbursed. Things like travelling to the constituency, getting accommodation to live there, if you didn't already. And you have to do that for selection, never mind for the election process, which can take three or four years sometimes. But perhaps most importantly, you need to de dedicate all of your time to being a candidate, which means that you can't work full time anymore. So you're sacrificing your salary, you're sacrificing your career progression. Now that's really difficult to do unless you have independent wealth, which is why a lot of people in politics have independent wealth. Or if you have a very flexible career, for example, if you work within politics or if you're a barrister, hence why we see a lot of people in politics who are career politicians or barristers. That's why. It's been estimated that the cost of running for office, the cost that goes personally to the candidate that comes out of their own pocket, is about £60,000. That is an enormous barrier. And women face additional barriers as well. They face sexism and discrimination, especially pertaining to motherhood. They face discriminatory treatment in the media. They face online harassment, rape threats, things that fortunately men don't have to deal with. And they come up against male networks where men get the insider tip-offs. They get the closed ranks that leave the woman on the outside. And politics is a really brutal career. It's incredibly demanding. It's all-consuming. It's also a very insecure career, especially if you're in one of those marginal seats, which is where women usually are which uh, is because those are the only seats that aren't blocked up by male incumbents, which means that you can contest an election for three or four years and then lose. Or maybe you win and you are in office for five years and then you get voted out again and you've sabotaged your career and everything else for something that turned out to be relatively ephemeral. And it's a very public career. You have to live your life under the public magnifying glass. A lot of women are not comfortable about subjecting their families to that level of scrutiny in a way that uh, seems to bother men a lot less. And it's also a lifestyle that is very incompatible with family life, the working hours, the division of your life between two locations. And so it's very difficult to be a woman in politics. And there are many disadvantages that also, and additionally, affect people who don't come from positions of privilege, people from ethnic minorities, people who are disabled, people who are LGBT, and so on. And a lot of the people that I've spoken to about these barriers kind of see them as almost inevitable. In some respects, as a baptism of fire, that you need to be able to take the heat or otherwise get out of the kitchen. Because it is a brutal career in Parliament, so you better get used to it, honey. And I'm concerned by those attitudes. I'm concerned about these barriers. And I'm trying to explore ways in which we might be able to overcome them to see whether they are truly necessary to be a politician, and if so, how we can assist with them, or whether we can just put them to one side. And every career is shaped, to at least some extent, by a little bit of luck. So I got lucky first time with uh, Segalen Royale running for office, which she did. And so France has blessed me a second time by having a very interesting election last year which created a natural experiment for me. You probably know that Emmanuel Macron got elected French president last year, a relative political outsider. And amazingly, he managed to take a political party that he'd only formed himself one year earlier and win a parliamentary majority with this party. And he deliberately and specifically chose political outsiders to be his candidates. And so in a country that normally kept re-electing the same people year after year after year, we came across this unprecedented scenario where suddenly 75% of the members of parliament had never previously held electoral office. And there they are, they're almost 50% women within Macron's group, and they are political amateurs. And so this has given an enormous opportunity that I am very eager to take advantage of, to test my theories on a natural real-world experiment and see what happens when you do sweep out the status quo and bring in a bunch of amateurs, half of them are women. What alternative qualities do these people bring to Parliament and to the representative process? And um, 
Are they differently qualified for the job? I would note that they are still disproportionately drawn from social elites, but they are at least more representative, more diverse than what came before. And are they perceived to be more representative of the people as a, as a result of coming from these more diverse backgrounds? And interesting, do they have a harder time of being politicians because they are new to the job? Does their lack of experience make them less effective in their ability to do the job? And if so, how long does it take them to become effective and to learn the job? And in the meantime, did that 25% of candidates who had done the job previously get to rule the roost because they have this huge informational advantage? And what does that mean? Or does it just allow the government to rule okay because they've now got a bunch of people in Parliament who don't know what they're doing and can be taken advantage of? So how does all this work? And how do the individuals who came into Parliament find the experience? Because most of them never expected to win, and they never even thought about standing until a couple of months beforehand. And so they weren't really prepared for the experience. Did it surpass their expectations, or did it turn out to be an enormous challenge and burden that they weren't adequately prepared for? So I look forward to finding out all those answers in due course. You've all sat very patiently for a long time, so I'm just going to offer some concluding thoughts here now. We see that politics is a process that is based on the ability to act politically and based on privilege, not merit. And this is problematic because it hinders the recruitment of talent into politics, it hinders the recruitment of diversity into politics. And the consequences of that are that we don't have the best people for the job. We don't have a parliament that reflects the population, which creates disengagement with politics. And we have a decision-making process that may be suboptimal and that may exclude important perspectives. And so we have to ask ourselves, if this is the problem, what's the solution? What do we do about it? Should we become more professional in the way that we organise politics? Maybe we should try a professional recruitment process rather than 30 people in a back room choosing their mates. Maybe we should have you know, proper advertising, job descriptions, personal specifications, holding people up against specific criteria. Or maybe we should go in the opposite direction and try to become more amateur in the process so that we are not career recruiting career politicians but are trying to target people more broadly in society. Maybe we need to give people more training in how better to prepare for the process. <coughs> or maybe instead, we need to focus on quotas so that rather than telling the candidates running for office to be better, we are telling the people selecting them to be better at uh, selecting effectively. And maybe we need to give more resources to the people trying to get into office to level the playing field so that you don't have to come from privilege in order to be able to represent other people. And so I've been working on these problems as an academic for a long time, and I continue to do so. And I'm now also currently trying to work with political parties to try and find answers to these problems that work and that are workable for them as well. And I would be delighted to hear what you think and to get your take on these questions as well. So thank you for sitting so patiently through this lecture, and um, I'm now delighted to invite you to come and join the program afterwards. by saying thank you very, very, very much to um, Rainbow for such a, a wide-ranging and thought-provoking and really, really exciting um, uh, overview of your research. And you know, this is what I meant when I said at the, um, at the start in my introduction that what's so great about Rainbow is that she has got that razor-sharp intellect and she's really pulling apart a lot of these questions that, that, that we need answers to. So we're very, I'm very grateful that we have Rainbow and that she is continuing to tackle all of these amazing and really, really important questions that are important for politics, but also really every um, aspect of, of life, um, not just in the UK, but also internationally. <coughs> so I'd like to say thank you again um, to Rainbow and thank you to all of you for coming along today. And now you can clap. Yeah. Yeah.